also huge reveals and reports about the future for Kang in the Marvel Universe. The suit is all going to take this out. And since Marvel announced that King the Conqueror would be the next Thanos level threat, the big bad of the multiversal saga, Marvel fans have been wondering uh, how. Now don't get me wrong, Kang in the comics is awesome and he's incredibly powerful, but he's rarely seen as being at the power level of something like Thanos or even someone like Doctor Doom. Now we got a tease of this in Loki season one, which was a brilliant way to show that the entirety of the Infinity Saga, including Thanos as a threat, was basically just a story written by one of the versions of Kang the Conqueror. And that Kang the Conqueror had assembled this entire organization known as the TVA that treats Infinity Stones like they're paperweights, has the ability to travel anywhere in any way, and can destroy branch timelines and entire universes. But we recently got another big piece of this puzzle in Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania. And that's what this video is about, combining all of the information that we have available to try to figure out what happens next with Kang the Conqueror and why he will indeed be more of a threat than Thanos ever was. And so in this video, we're gonna go over comments by Marvel producers. We're gonna deep dive on what scoopers and insiders have said. And we're gonna focus on some very interesting details in the Quantum Mania film that fans are already having crazy theories about. It's gonna get sweaty, it's gonna get nerdy. Smash a like on this video and let's begin. Now the first thing I wanna talk about in this video is how Kang is this massive threat and why Kang and his variants are going to be everywhere in the Marvel Universe as we get to the next two Avengers films. Let's start by talking about comments made by a Marvel producer named Steven Broussard. Just a couple of weeks ago, Screen Rant literally just asked this dude to his face, why is Kang more of a threat than Thanos? Screen Rant literally says Kang is the next big Avengers level threat after Thanos, and Thanos wiped out half the universe. What makes Kang even more dangerous? And Broussard says, I think what makes Kang is so dangerous is that we're almost caught in a war of gods. They clearly exist in this heightened state. They've cracked the code of the multiverse, as He Who Remains kind of explains to us, and they form this uneasy alliance. It doesn't always go well, which is why they banish Kang the Conqueror here. And humanity, as they say, is starting to scratch the door of the multiverse. We've been protected. We've sort of isolated in what I call our terrarium, which is the analogy we used in Loki season one. That door gets kicked down, which is what you see in the events of No Way Home, and even the events of Multiverse of Madness. And there's a chaos that breeds into that. The chaos of possibility and the chaos of different things colliding together is really scary to me. There was a singularness of Thanos that was frightening, but Kangs don't even agree amongst themselves, which is what's exciting to think about. The unpredictable nature of that feels like it's a threat that is every bit as scary as Thanos, but not feeling like a retread to us. Now, Broussard also talks further about this in some more recent interviews, and I'm gonna go over that now. So he continues by saying, moving forward, the connectivity and where these films can talk to each other in exciting ways starts to come together. That form follows the function of making something entertaining, aspiring to make a great series in Loki, and aspiring to make a great movie in Quantumania. Now, Broussard then is asked about the connection to Kang in the Fantastic Four, and his answer is really interesting. He says, I don't want to speak too specifically about what might or might not happen in that film, the Fantastic Four. They obviously have an amazing rogues gallery, and the sky's the limit with them, but Kang as a force, Kang as a plurality, feels very exciting to us, and I think there will be no corner of the MCU that won't be affected by Jonathan and by Kang moving forward. Steven says, that feels very exciting to us. The idea of Jonathan playing these characters is very unique. I was just trying to think this morning about, like, is there anything comparable in movies to this character playing radically different versions of the same person? It feels so unique to explore, and I'm glad we get to be the ones to do it. So you can kind of see that from Marvel's perspective, they're really excited to play around with the idea of one person playing all of these different versions and essentially the entire multiverse being assaulted by not 
one villain, but an entire group of variants of one villain. And they also see every single corner of the Marvel Universe being affected by Jonathan Major's Kang or a Kang variant in some way, shape, or form. And of course, the two post-credit scenes for Quantum Mania set up this reality as well. You have the first post-credit scene, which has the Council of Kangs and three main Kangs leading this group of variants. And then you have Victor Timely being tracked down in a timeline by the TVA. And Loki Season 2 is obviously the next big chapter where a lot of this stuff is going to be explored, and the second post credit scene in Quantumania sets that up perfectly. According to insider Daniel RPK, Loki Season 2 is going to have a lot of Jonathan Major, and these variants we meet in Loki Season 2 will have a major impact on the Marvel Cinematic Universe going forward. This is a report that's corroborated by the Cosmic Circus. They've recently been talking a lot about the different variants that will be in Loki. In one of their most recent reports, they essentially said you're going to see a lot more Jonathan Majors than you might think in Loki Season 2. So we'll obviously be getting Victor Timely as one of these variants in Loki Season 2, but you might also be getting a variant named Mr. Griffin. You can actually see Mr. Griffin in that crazy Coliseum scene with all of the different Kang variants in that post credit scene. And Scooper's My Time to Shine Hello and Can We Get Some Toast are both confirming that Mr. Griffin is coming to the MCU. You. But it's going to go way past Loki Season 2, and the report from Daniel makes me think that they're going to be setting up some specific variants that will then go on to interact with Marvel characters in different movies and shows beyond Loki. Like, it just came out from a leaker known as Film Odyssey that Shang-Chi 2 is going to happen before the Kang Dynasty, and it will involve a Kang variant as well. Agatha Coven of Chaos is being pushed off into the future, and there's been a lot of talk from insiders that they're reworking elements of that story to include a variant of Kang that has perhaps rewritten the Darkhold or manipulated magic. The Fantastic Four movie is likely to have Kang variants. We assume Deadpool 3 involving the TVA and all of the multiverse will also have us encountering a Kang variant. And so what this basically means is that the villains in phases 5, 6, and leading into the next Avengers movie are going to be the Kang Dynasty. So after the events of Quantumania, Kang the Conqueror is sort of off the table. We'll talk more about that in a moment here. But the Dynasty itself is now going to be the villain. So you'll see all kinds of different versions of Kang in all of these different projects. Like there's even supposed to be a Doctor Strange 3 movie possibly coming out before the next two Avengers movies. And I would assume you'd get a Kang variant in that. There might even be an Iron Lad variant in other Marvel movies movies or projects or shows. Who knows? But now I want to talk about some crazy details in Quantum Mania that give us even more information about what the Kang Dynasty is going to be doing when they're fighting all of these people. And a lot of this is coming from a big podcast done over at the Cosmic Circus. And Alex Perez, who's one of the members of the team over there, he has very good sources and he's really great at speculating and picking out details. He brought up a ton of crazy stuff that I want to go over with you now. First of all, Alex talks about how there was originally a scene in the film where Kang the Conqueror was going to recognize Hank Pam. And this would have sort of explained and indicated that in the teams of Avengers from the past versions of the multiversal loop, Kang recognized Hank Pym, and, and he knew what Hank Pym was about. Kind of interesting that they cut that from the movie. Maybe they just didn't want to commit to that idea right out the gate. They also talk about in the podcast how the dynasty of Kangs is particularly upset with the Pims and with the Van Dimes, and that the events of Quantum Mania essentially break the entire multiverse out of its crazy loop. They even talk about in the podcast how the Kangs are likely to kill one or more members of that family in the actual Kang dynasty. They're literally seeking revenge. And it's talked about how this is again because the loop is now broken, that the entire multiverse was essentially running on a loop, but the events of this movie break them out of the loop. This was not supposed to happen. Kang the Conqueror was meant to be in exile for some time and then eventually break out of his loop. It's even possible that Amortis is the one that is supposed to kill the Kang the Conqueror variant, which is why that other character says, you're probably just jealous that you're not the one that killed him. And so it's possible that the Council of Kangs is now 
now in uncharted waters. They don't know exactly what's going to happen next, and this is why they're so focused on messing with and destroying the Avengers of the 616 universe. Now, Alex Perez does talk about how Kang the Conqueror is sucked into this multiversal battery, and essentially this is going to make him into the Beyonder. This is a rumor that was established months ago by My Time to Shine Hello, and it seems pretty obvious to most people that watch the movie that this Kang the Conqueror variant is going to go somewhere through the multiversal engine beyond the known multiverse and come back likely with powers way beyond any other Kang variant. So you're not likely to see that Kang the Conqueror variant until maybe the end of the Kang Dynasty or until we get into Secret Wars. Again, that means he's off the table and you'll focus on the Kang Dynasty and their revenge in the coming years. And this is where things really start to pick up as there are theories that even the end of Quantum Mania is something of a lie or a time loop for Scott Lang. And I was seeing fans talk about this a lot after the movie came out and New Rockstars recently did a very good video breaking down this possibility. The ending of that movie is really weird. There's differences from when you first see Scott doing all of these things out there in the world. Like the cake guy actually recognizes him correctly and charges him for the first time. There's graffiti on the wall that wasn't there originally. The people that pass Scott by pass him by multiple times and it's almost as if the film is drawing attention to how weird people are acting. And there's even the crazy dog in the baby carriage thing, which I'm being told by people isn't that weird for folks in California. But regardless, it does seem like something's going on with Scott. Perhaps even his internal dialogue is something that's been manipulated. So perhaps Scott, upon exiting the quantum realm, is immediately captured or controlled by the dynasty of Kangs. And they're enacting their revenge by keeping Scott in some kind of a weird time loop so that he can't interfere while they go change other things about the timeline. Like, it's even possible that the Kangs have completely changed the world, altering time in really interesting ways, so that when Scott actually jumps back into the 616 universe, things are just different. And this would all depend on whether or not these other versions of Kang have multiversal engines, which would allow them to perhaps actually change time as opposed to just going back into the past and creating branch realities. There's a shot all the way back in Loki season one that showed Sylvie trying to mine this time ore. New Rockstars recently broke this down on their deep dive channel in a fantastic video, but it makes me think that Sylvie was likely digging for whatever this time or is to perhaps create her own multiversal engine. And the existence of that scene in Loki makes me think that there's more than one way to get a multiversal engine, and if Sylvie's doing it, of course Kang and all of his different variants would have the ability to do that as well. I think it would make a lot of sense if these different Kangs had multiversal engines that would really help them to be able to craft and cater all of the different timelines that they have we into each other. And so it may be the case that Scott is now in an altered Earth, but I think it's possible that all of the different Marvel characters are going to be experiencing changes in time. Like, maybe some of the coming crazy rumors for Marvel, like Red Hulk, Thunderbolt Ross being the president, or Kingpin actually being the mayor of New York City, maybe some of those changes are not even going to be explained and just accepted as status quo. And then we'll come to a place that we realize as the audience that this is actually a change specifically done by the Kings. Now, there's another really interesting detail in Quantum Mania that Alex Perez and the Cosmic Circus team talk about in their podcast, and it is this shot right here of 
four branches coming off the 616 timeline when Janet uses the machine in the chair of Kang in order to chart their course home. Now, nobody knows exactly what all of these different strands or these branch timelines are. This could be more evidence of the Kang dynasty altering the 616 timeline and fixing time. But as I just said, I think they might have the power to do that without creating branches. My theory on what these branches are, are that they are actually the four unique variants of Kang that come from the first timeline, the sacred timeline, and that the reason they are not pruned is because they all lead to the main variants of the Kang dynasty, which I think would be Rama Tut, the Centurion, who's not the Scarlet Centurion anymore, Amortis, and Kang the Conqueror. I think at one time, these were the four main Kang variants that all happened to come from the 616 timeline. And so perhaps the sacred timeline is actually four separate sacred timelines, or maybe one that branches off into four. It's even possible there's a TVA in every single one of the timelines that the Kangs are keeping alive. I know that's all really wonky, crazy, time travel, mind-bending stuff, but essentially what we need to know is that they're going to be doing a ton of different Kang variants messing with the Marvel Universe as we know it in the next couple of years and that they have some really crazy stuff planned between this movie, the Loki shows, Shang-Chi 2, and all of these different films before we get into the Kang Dynasty. But now I want to talk about one little line spoken by Kang in Quantum Mania that to me sent my spider sense into a frenzy. And this is the comment made by Kang about destroying a turn Eternity. Eternity is an incredibly powerful Marvel cosmic entity. You can think of Eternity as like the power behind everything and anything within the universe. And we've seen Eternity in the MCU, and look, I didn't love the sort of wishing stone version of Eternity in Thor Love and Thunder, but when you really think about that power, the power to grant any wish that there is, you're talking about the power to alter the multiverse or a universe in a way that I don't think Kang can actually do. We learned in the What If series that there are fixed moments in time. There are things that just have to happen for the universe to work together, and no power that we know of can alter these fixed moments in time. The Doctor Strange episode shows us that even with incredible power, you can't change certain things, and if you do, that entire universe is destroyed. And so I think it will be revealed that even the dynasty of Kangs and all of the different Kang variants don't actually have the ability or power to change certain things in the timeline. That every unique universe and branches off of those universes will still have things that just have to happen. It's almost like Kang can shift things around, can change certain aspects of characters or moments, but there are just some core things that will always happen. But I think Eternity actually has the ability to completely change that. Like, for instance, I think if the Doctor Strange variant in What If was able to get to eternity in his own universe, and he had then asked to save his lover, I think Christine Palmer would have actually been saved and the universe wouldn't have been destroyed. And I think that might actually be why the Dynasty of Kangs fears Kang the Conqueror, because this variant of Kang is absolutely hell-bent on destroying Eternity and breaking free completely from the chains of time. In that same scene, before he mentions Eternity, he's talking about how time isn't what you think it is. He talks about how it's a prison, how it will beat you down. He talks about loss and that Janet has no idea what he has lost. Now, they actually go over this in that podcast from the Cosmic Circus, and Alex Perez brings up the fact that in the Secret Wars comic, the Beyonder destroys Eternity, and then that all kicks off Secret Wars. And I think he's referring to the most recent Secret Wars in which the Beyonders destroy all of the Marvel entities, including Eternity. But we've also seen that there are trademarks for Eternity 
Wars, which is said to be another Avengers film that takes place after Secret Wars. And so what I think might be happening is you'll get Kang the Conqueror going into the Beyond and receiving the powers of the Beyonder. And I think what he is looking to do is destroy Eternity, perhaps even the multiversal Eternity, to actually be able to reshape the multiverse completely the way he wants. But I'm not sure that he's actually going to be able to do that. I think this will be the thing he's trying to accomplish in Secret Wars while also holding off all of these multiversal Avengers and then he's unable to do so but perhaps he does something to make Eternity actually want to fight against the Avengers or to make other entities in the multiverse aware of what they could do if they defeated Eternity. The Eternity War story in Marvel Comics actually saw a character that's an evil variant of Reed Richards known as the Maker and that character is manipulated slash teams up with an entity known as the First Firmament who's like Eternity except he's from the very first universe that there ever was and he also wants to destroy Eternity. And I know, I know, I know we're getting really sweaty, we're getting really nerdy but I say all of that to just bring up the point that I think Eternity is being intentionally said in the Quantum Mania film, intentionally set up in Love and Thunder, and I think it's going to be a major part of what the Beyonder Kang actually wants, and I think it will also tee up even more crazy stuff for the Marvel Cinematic Universe after Secret Wars. So there you go, guys. That's our best look possible with all the new details of what happens next with Kang and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Let me know what you think about all of this. If you want to watch more, why not check out this video I recently did all about the future for Star Wars movies. Please subscribe, like this video, have a great night, and see you guys. Bye.